Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being here with, the, with us today. I have the pleasure of uh, having, hosting this legal update webinar for 2021-2022 with Dan Wasserstein. Uh, we're gonna be going over a two hour webinar. Uh, this is a CU credit. Uh, so for those managers, please make sure you provide us with your CAM license number. And Dan and his team will make sure to give you the necessary credits uh, for this particular class. Uh, we will be taking Q&A, so please go ahead and use the Q&A below. Feel free to put any questions that you may have. We'll both do our best to answer all questions today. Um, and we'll go ahead and answer those either through the Q&A directly or I'll ask Dan or myself uh, to answer those questions. Again, thank you so much for, for being here today. I wanted to introduce Dan Wasserstein. Dan, if you wanna say a little bit about yourself and the firm. Sure. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Raphael. My name is Dan Wasserstein. I am a association attorney. Uh, all we, and well, me and my colleagues here in my office do all day, every day, is work with people like Raphael, management, and with people like you, board members. Uh, we don't do a little of this and a little of that. We strictly, 100% of our practice is representing community associations in the Tri-County area, uh, Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach. Uh, it's me and three other lawyers. We have a full staff. And we really, I think, I think we differentiate ourselves by being really accessible, responsive, and we really will tailor uh, our representation to your board style. So uh, if you're looking for a lawyer who uh, picks up the phone and calls you back when you need it and gets your work done in a timely fashion, uh, you know, I can tell you we have 300 clients that will attest to what we do. And I, I work my rear end off to make sure that happens. So I thank, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present to everyone today and uh, you know, back to you, Raphael. No problem, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, it says a lot when you're dealing directly with the owner of the organization. I've always learned, uh, I mean, obviously we're, I'm the owner of our organization, but we've learned that it's always great to deal with the principles. You're able to get the solutions and the answers that are needed uh, much quicker and much faster. And it's funny you say about picking up the phone, uh, definitely a total, total difference when you're working with more of a medium-sized organization. As for myself, my name is Rafael Aquino. I am the CEO and co-founder of Affinity Management Services. We are a community association management company. Uh, similar to Dan's firm, we're more of a medium-sized firm. Uh, we focus on really finding the solutions and, and providing results uh, to our clients. Uh, we do service Dade, Broward, and we're growing now into the Palm Beach County. Um, so if you have any challenges or you have any questions with regards to your management services, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call. But more importantly, we are here today to provide you some, some education. Hopefully some of our listeners have been to several of our webinars. They know that our focus is to provide really board members and managers with the knowledge that's necessary to continue to push our industry forward, as well as uh, continue to enhance the lives of the board members and the residents that we serve. So enough about us then, uh, why don't we get started with the legal update? I know you have a presentation. Sure. Again, I wanted to remind everyone that the Q&A is open. So feel free to put your questions. You'll find that either on the top of your screen or on the bottom of your screen. And both Dan and myself will do our best uh, to answer your questions. All right. All right, can everyone, uh, everyone can hopefully see that. Raphael, you got that? Yes, we're live. All right, all right. So this is the 2021 uh, going into 2022 legislative update. This is gonna highlight the changes that we've seen to the laws for condominiums, HOAs, and also a couple COVID uh, restrictions that are important for all of us in this world of uh, community associations to consider. So again, as Raphael said, if you have a question, uh, please, you know, there's a QA, and a uh, there's a chat feature, feel free to ask. And uh, if we go buy something, uh, we can always go back to it. So. Uh, this is, uh, for the people who are managers, this is a two-hour CEU in the legislative update area. And again, if you submit us to us or really to Ashley or Raphael, uh, if you can come up with a list of the CAMs and you want to send us their numbers, that would be the easiest way. Um, but yeah, for everyone else, I hope this is informative for you. And again, just so it's not me talking and commenting the whole time, uh, feel free to ask questions through the Q&A function. All right, so we're gonna start with condominiums. And the, one of the most important things that was updated, as you can imagine, are emergency powers. Now, before I get into that, let me just say one thing. 
Surfside, we all know that happened, uh, you know, over the summer. And these laws went into effect in July. So a lot of people sometimes say, well, Dan, how come they didn't update some of the laws uh, on construction and things like that? And the answer is the legislative session ended a few months ago before Surfside occurred. So any legal changes that result from Surfside, at least at the state level, we're going to see those going into law in 2022. So, uh, you know, a lot of what we see uh, in 2021 this year are things that are really reactions to COVID as well as other, uh, you know, just regular sort of updates. The first one being this one, again, a reaction to COVID is emergency powers. For many years, these emergency powers existed, both in the condo and the HOA statute, as well as cooperatives. It was enacted back, I think, uh, when Hurricane Irma, not Irma, sorry, uh, 05, I forget, <laughs> Wilma. Wilma. Wilma was 05. After that, the state enacted these emergency powers so that boards in response to a disaster like a hurricane could hold meetings, raise capital if they needed money, uh, borrow money without having to get member votes, uh, if those were needed by the documents, and you know, communicate with the, the community, shut down portions of the building. Again, thinking of a natural disaster. Well, now 2020 and 21, we had a natural, it was circumstance, but not a disaster. So really the emergency power statute kicked in because the governor declared a state of emergency, but a lot of practitioners like my, you know, me and my colleagues, the way the statute was written, it was not written for a biological or a viral uh, pandemic. It was written for a physical disaster, you know, a hurricane, a tornado, thing, uh, you know, uh, maybe even war, you know, something where buildings are destroyed, things are blown out. Um, it wasn't a, a biological uh, disease sort of uh, concern statute. So some of the provisions in it, the way it was worded, were not really conducive to what we're dealing with, the pandemic. So some, some lawyers would say, well, can we really use these powers uh, because of COVID when we don't have a hurricane? And look, most of us, I think, erred on the side of, yeah, we're going to use these powers. The state of emergency was declared. We don't care what it was for. Uh, we're not going to you know, parse words. We're going to let our boards do what they need to do to get things done. Uh, and that's what we did. But there were some holes. There were questions what, you know, about meetings and things like that. So in the new statute, as you can see here, now if there's a state of emergency, uh, boards can feel comfortable that they can hold all of their meetings 100% virtual uh, you know, in those circumstances. There were questions about, well, can we, can we do a purely virtual meeting? Um, so this clarifies that, yes, you can have a purely virtual meeting under a state of emergency. Uh, you also can, of course, close down parts of the building uh, or your condominium, especially, you know, communities were closing clubhouses, swimming pools, tennis courts, gyms. You know, this again confirms that the board, using its best discretion and advice of its professionals, yeah, you can shut those things down. But what you can't do is tell people they can't use common areas that they need to get in and out of their unit. Like you can't tell people they can't use the lobby if they need to access the elevators that are in the lobby to get to their unit. So there was a case, uh, I think it was in, I was just in South uh, Boca where an association was sued during COVID because they basically would not allow uh, the owners to use certain areas uh, of the property uh, because of COVID and some of the owners sued saying, hey, that's you're basically locking us into our condo uh, and that's not right. So while you can shut certain areas down, amenity type areas, just be mindful that you still gotta let people in and out. Um, and there's some other you know, restrictions on the law here. I won't go into all of it, uh, in detail, but it's there for you to read. Uh, and of course, now a disaster plan or emergency plan can be implemented during the emergency. 
rather than uh, just before or after. So again, you know, if you find yourself, hey, all of a sudden we're in the midst of this crisis again, uh, and there's a state of emergency, you can implement a plan uh, in the midst of it. So just yeah. some of my commentary. As I, I said, I do these have are... I do go have ahead. a question here, Dan. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. I do have a no, question which has to do with regards to the meeting. So Ziamora asked, since the governor didn't extend the state of emergency, can the board continue to meet online via Zoom? That's a great question and one I've been getting a lot of. Uh, sure. The answer, the legal answer is you cannot purely meet on Zoom because the state of emergency is over unless you amend your bylaws to allow for the board to hold meetings virtually you know, when the circumstances warrant. Because the only reason we've been allowed to do all these Zoom meetings purely by Zoom was that governor's order uh, declaring a state of emergency that existed for about a year. Uh, once that was shut down, and look, I know some condos are still, and HOAs are still doing it that way, and no one's probably going to complain too much about it, but let's say you're having a significant vote at your board meeting, like a special assessment, you don't want someone to unravel that by saying, hey, well, they had the meeting entirely on Zoom, and, you know, little old Gertrude who's a hundred years old, who doesn't have a computer or a cell phone, wanted to go to the meeting and she couldn't go because they didn't give her the opportunity and they had no legal right to do that. So what we advise our clients is they should have a hybrid meeting right now where they have a physical location. And even if they just, the board members don't even have to show up, they're allowed to be remote. Uh, all you need is at least one person at that physical location that can open up the Zoom on their phone or on their laptop or tablet so that whoever is physically at that location can hear everyone online uh, and everyone online can hear who's ever at the physical location. I think that's perfectly fine. I had a board have a meeting about a week or two ago. The property manager was at their clubhouse uh, with, their, with their laptop in the Zoom all the board members were at their home on the Zoom. Several unit owners, homeowners were at home. A couple physically showed up and said, well, where is everyone? And the manager said, it's just me. You're feel, you can feel free to stay here because we had to give a physical location, but most everyone's on Zoom. And those people left and they went home. So I will tell you, if you do a hybrid, most people will utilize the Zoom. But again, it's the safest way legally to prevent people from questioning uh, the authority of your meeting, unless of course your governing documents are amended to specifically say that you can do this. Yeah, and if I can add to that, I mean, as you said, Dan, I, I've seen this, the same thing. Um, we recently just had an annual meeting um, and what we did was similar to what you said, we had the manager there, the, the regional director there and the two or three people that actually did show up once they knew it was on Zoom, they decided to all, to all go home. But the beauty of what, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, difficult times having to deal with COVID, a lot of challenges, a lot of losses. Um, but in the same token, a lot of benefits came to our associations, which is the speeding up of technology. Um, most associations, at least for those that didn't have, let's say, uh, cameras or TVs or uh, computers, now they're starting to make those small investments because it, it only makes sense, right? You get a higher, a higher participation from the residents when they're able to attend via Zoom. And we're especially seeing that with the snowbird communities, um, as well as the communities that are owned by investors, the outside investors where they're unable to attend because of the distance. Right. No, that's a good point. And I can tell you as the lawyer, technology is a gift and a curse, right? So, so, you know, people say, well, this has been great because with Zoom and technology, we have more participation at meetings. But then I also hear from boards this is bad because we have more participation at meetings. And the reason I, <laughs> and I say that it's not that they don't want people to participate. It's that you get, we're get, what we're seeing is a lot more people who would otherwise not have invested the two minutes to walk to the clubhouse Yeah, because it's so simple. They go on zoom and it's like something to do from their couch. And all of a sudden now they're, they're gumming up the meetings when, you know, if it was at, if it was somewhere five minutes away, maybe one person would show up now because of Zoom, 
they have 50 people show up. So their meetings are taking much longer. Uh, People that aren't used to going to meetings are not used to the decorum and how, you know, they have to, you know, wait their turn to ask questions and things. So it's been great to facilitate participation uh, and hopefully the quality level of the participation uh, as people get more familiar with it will get better. Correct. Excellent points. Yeah. So in any way, there's just some other comments here on some of these emergency changes. Um, you know, one of the things that still remain unclear is, you know, the ability to conduct a vote. Uh, you know, you can't do technically, you're not supposed to do a vote of the members over Zoom. Like everyone, hey, you know, you know, Mary Smith, do you vote yes or no on the document amendment? You know, and have her say, I vote yes. You know, like that's, you need a paper trail. The doc, the let, the statute wants you to have paper voting or some sort of uh, voting in that form. So, you know, that's one thing where people said, well, can we have membership meetings purely by Zoom? And again, during the pandemic, I would tell them, yeah, you can during the pandemic in the state of emergency. But if your owners are voting, they still need to send in a proxy and people, you know, the person named as proxy still has to show up. So there's, it's, it's getting better, uh, as Raphael mentioned, but uh, still some open issues. All right, so we'll go to the next, uh, the next slide here, which has to do with transfer fees and security deposits. For many, many years, uh, the maximum an association, a condo, I should say, could charge an applicant was $100. Now it's $150 per applicant. So that's good. It's a 50% jump. It's been 100 for many, many years. And this is important because there were, in 2016, there was a Miami Herald article uh, and there was a class action lawsuit against, I think about 50 Mm -hmm. Miami-Dade high-rise condos. They were all charging, they were charging $150 for this and 100 for an application and $100 for a move-in fee and $300 for an application fee and a a transfer fee. And there were some instances where people just to move into the building in fees were paying $1,000, $2,000. And those were the most egregious ones. But even a lot of the other ones were just, they were charging $300 instead of $100. And unfortunately, uh, you know, the statute's very clear and there was litigation and there was, again, there was a big article in the Herald and so this, this was kind of brought to a head and it's important that only, uh, that only the 150 per person be charged, but at least that's an increased amount. Have you, what's your experience been with this, Raphael? Yeah, so no, this was great for our industry because many times, you know, especially with internationals that we get a lot of that down here in Miami, um, you know, we were, there was, we were coming out of pocket for those background searches. So, so this is a great improvement. But as you stated, then we saw the same thing, especially when we take on new associations where, We've seen them charging 175, 200, 300, and we have to clear that up uh, immediately. Oh, yeah. um, so it's it's a big pushback from the boards because you know they've done things the way they've done them for X amount of time. But at the end of the day, you know we need to guide ourselves by by what the law states. Um, I'm also it's also great that they put the CPI into the law, so mm-hmm. that we don't have to be going into this battle because this was as you stated. Um, of a three to four year battle with the back and forth between the realtor association and our industry and so forth on getting these increases. But ultimately I do want to, you know, notify those condos because really for the HOAs, this doesn't apply. It's if you're charging those elevator fees, make sure you're contacting your attorney um, to clarify that. If you're work with Dan, make sure you contact him because those fees are really not, they're not, not really, they're not permitted. Pet, <laughs> um, pet, 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 pet fees, fees, correct, correct. The whole that whole case, the class, it said anything. If you're trying to charge them any any money when they move in, whatever you want to call it for whatever reason, unless it's fully refundable, if it's a just a pure fee that's that's charged upon move in, one hundred fifty dollars a person is the max. And there's certain people that count as one, like a husband and wife, they count as one applicant under the statute. So just important to be mindful of. And yeah, the CPI, the five-year increase, that's great because yeah, again, we're not, we're not locked to this money. And in a few years, you know, five years from now, it'll go up again. So that's, that's a good thing. They also added in that the authority, uh, which originally had to be in your declaration or bylaws. So quickly, I'll just share. I added a condo. They had no authority in their declaration or bylaws. They only had it in their rules and regulations. 
And like Raphael said, I had to have the uncomfortable conversation to tell them, you can't charge this because it's only in your rules and regulations that you, the board, voted on. And it's not, a, not an authorized charge unless your declaration or bylaws say you can charge a transfer fee. Well, they updated the statute. I wish they would have updated it to allow it to be in the rules and regulations. But all they did was just al allow it to be authorized in the Articles of Incorporation, which I can tell you, I've never seen an Articles of Incorporation that talks about leasing and transfer fees. Articles Neither of Incorporation <laughs> are just set up documents that set up the initial structure uh, like of your board and who, what the officers and, and those sort of things. They don't go into restrictions like this. So kind of a meaningless addition, but maybe there's a few older communities out there that uh, had it for some reason in their articles. And uh, well, now they can make use of that. So that's a good thing. All right, moving on. Another uh, hot button issue the last, I'd say four years for condominiums has been these term limits. In 2017, the legislature came out with this provision that said, if you're on the board for four consecutive two-year terms or an eight-year term combined, that you had to jump through all these hoops to, if you wanted to be elected for a ninth year, uh, then they changed it instead of being four two-year terms, they, which was nonsense. They just said eight years, which makes a lot more sense right? Like who cares how long the terms are, whether it's a one year, two year, three year term, if it's eight in a row, that's really what they were after. So that changed in 2018, but we were still left with questions. The most important being, does time served apply? Meaning in 2018, if I had already been on the board for eight years, did I now have to jump through the statutory hoops if I wanted to be elected for a ninth year or could I just run like normal, like any other candidate? And there were some practitioners, me included, that said, this is not retroactive. It doesn't apply to time served. It starts in 2018. Uh, that's when the eight years starts. And, uh, and there were other lawyers that felt differently, but at least finally, uh, we have a clarification. Uh, the DBPR had originally uh, mentioned that they were going to go along with this as well. Uh, and this is how I advise my clients, but again, it's clarified now. And that clarification is that the eight years of service runs from July, 2018. So basically after 2026 or in 2026 is when this term limit law will really start to have an impact, uh, and where it'll really, uh, matter. So that's, uh, that was a good, a really important distinction. And that's just, you know, some of the commentary you'll have, you'll see here. Uh, there's still some correct, you know, some things that they could address. For example, in the middle paragraph, it says you have to serve for eight consecutive years. I, during the midst of the uncertainty for a, to help a board member, and this is where lawyering comes in, right? I said to them, well, the statute says it has to be eight consecutive years. So I said a week before the election, why don't you resign from the board? And then you're not subject to jump through the new, the, the extra statutory hoops to get back on the board because you served seven years, 11 months and three weeks, not eight years consecutively because you quit. Uh, and there are statutes uh, that address this issue, like the, like the statute for the governor. Uh, and you know, running for governor, it addresses this issue where if someone resigned like in the middle of their term, they aren't eligible to run for governor if they're otherwise restricted based on term limits. So basically you can't kind of you know, you know, game the system, but they didn't put that in this statute. So I actually argued that we didn't end up having to get a ruling because the person contesting it uh, relented, but uh, it was an argument I made, and I think it's one that's still potentially a loophole. There's some other, uh, I won't, you know, the last paragraph is a little longer and, and specific, but it's worth a read. Uh, I won't bore you with it on the, on the Zoom here, but it's worth a read. And I've had people make the argument that I'm taking issue with in that last paragraph. Uh, so it's just something I would say is worth reading. I do see, Raphael, we have another question, I think. Yes, we do. Give me one. Uh it says term limits cannot, they still run if no comp if there's no competition. 
Right. So that's there's two exceptions. And when I, when I you heard me say jump through the statutory hoops. So if you were term limited out in 2026 or after and you still want to run for the board, you can run for the board and you will get on the board if there are no other willing candidates to fill all the seats. If there are enough candidates that you need an election and you're not guaranteed a seat because of people not wanting to participate, then you will need two thirds of the ballots cast in your favor. So normally it's just what we call a, uh, a why can't I think of the word? Uh, it's a, you know, as long as you get enough, a plurality, sorry. As long as you get, let's say you have five open seats, whoever gets the number of votes that's in the top five, no matter how many or few people cast votes, whoever the top five vote getters are, they win. Well, uh, now, if there's 100 votes cast, if you're one of these termed out people, you need 67 in your favor. So you need sort of a super majority if you want to serve for a ninth year. Um, but that's, again, that's not something to worry about for another five years. And when we do hit that point, again, that only applies if there aren't uh, other willing candidates to serve. I think there's another question. Yeah, there's another question here, Dan. They wanted uh, an anonymous, anonymous person was asking if they can get a copy of today's presentation. What I will tell them is that we will be posting the video mm -hmm. on our the Affinity YouTube page. And so you could share that with your board members. Um, but specifically to the presentation, Dan, I'm not sure if uh, you guys will be sharing that. Yeah, I mean, we do, we're happy for you to have the... Uh the presentation. I mean, I'm happy if you want to share this with your uh, with with the people on the call, I will tell everyone if you go to my website, uh, I believe it's on our website, the content, uh, not this exact presentation, but the content itself is all on our website. And, uh, and it's also on our blog, Florida Association Law blog.com. But if you go to wasserstein.pa.com and go to the blog link, or you go to was uh, Florida Association Law Blog, it's all there. So and what I'll do is before the webinar ends, uh, for our listeners, I'll go ahead and place uh, Dan's contact information, his blog information, his website, all on the uh, Q&A before the webinar ends. Perfect. All right, so moving on, board eligibility. This is one that changed strangely only for condominiums, not for HOAs. So for the last several years, it used to be that the law said you can't run for the board if you owe an assessment. And then the law realized, well, there's lots of other things people can owe to their association too, like fines, late fees, interest, attorney's fees. We have one guy that has a lawsuit against the association that he lost and he owes the association $14,000 of attorney's fees. And he has not for several years, he has not been, well, not several years, two years, while it's still been uh, in, on appeal, he's not been eligible to serve on the board because he owes those fees to the association. Well, now in a condominium association, they went backwards. So it used to be only, only assessments, then it was any money. Now it's back for condominiums to only assessments. So if you owe an assessment only, you can't run for the board. But if you owe anything else, an attorney's fee, a fine, a late fee, uh, you can still run for your board of directors. So uh, I don't know why they only did this for condos and not HOAs. I don't know why they would distinguish between one and the other, um, but it's an important thing for your people, Raphael, to know uh, because there is now a difference. You know, it's a lot easier for us, like me and Raphael and the managers, when everything is, is harmonized and it's the mm -hmm. same. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why, again, I have no reason for the distinction, but it is there. Um, and it does look, it's, uh, it's, it addresses one issue, um, but what about, what about the timing issue? You know, it doesn't clarify anything. What if, like, and I gave here, you know, let's say the unit owner's intent to run for the board is on the fifth of the month. That's when it's due based on just the way the, the, dead, the deadlines shake out. And what if the assessment that comes due on that month is past due? It's, it came due on the first, but it's not late until the 15th. Well, by the fifth of the month, they haven't paid an assessment. Do you, for that current month, do you tell them they're not allowed to run for the board because they owe something that's four days old? Well, the statute says you're, you know, it doesn't clarify that. It doesn't say that, you know, it has to be, the debt has to be at least 
you know, you know, 30 days past due or 90 days past due. It just says when you're running for the board, if you owe an assessment uh, that's past its due date, not its late date, its due date, you can't run for the board. So again, I just in my commentary kind of poke out, you know, I, I like to poke holes sometimes. I will tell you that me and my colleagues, we ask the legislators a lot. We'll tell them, hey, we have a whole section of the Florida bar that's all the condo and HOA lawyers. Why don't you ask us for some help? And they <laughs> always say, thank you, but no thank you. So you end up with glitches and other things that if, if they had let us participate, maybe would go away. I think in their mind, they feel like if they let the lawyers participate, like everyone feel, oh, they're going to lawyer it. And it's going to be, instead of being this big, it's going to be, you know, an encyclopedia, you know, of, of all sorts of conditions and, and exceptions and everything else. So anyway, it'd be nice if they would consult us, but uh, I, I understand uh, the other side of it too. So I do have a scenario that I like to throw at you, uh, Dan, because Daniel, because we get it all the time. And since we have so many managers on the call, mm -hmm. When it comes to, let's say, in preparation for uh, you get your um, people intent to run. So you have seven people that are intent to run. Would mm -hmm. you recommend the managers to check the delinquency report at that time before sending the second notice with the ballots? Or do yeah, you let those individuals get placed on and at the day of the election is when they should be checking the balances? No, they have to, the balances by statute need to be checked as of the last date that they are eligible to submit their candidacy to run for the board. So when they submit their candidacy or really on that deadline, which is 40 days before the election, mm -hmm. that's when your, your manager should be looking at the delinquency report and say, okay, are all these people eligible to be candidates? Then like, let's say, you know, once the ballots go out, if they miss the next assessment, they don't get pulled off the ballot because they were eligible at the time uh, when there was a deadline for their, them to throw their hat in the ring to be a candidate. So that's, that's the time uh, when you wanna make sure that they are paid up. Excellent. Yep. All right. Uh, so, you know, this dovetails into the next uh, amendment which had to do with collections and collection letters. And I think this was a product of COVID. It was also a product of one guy there was one guy who's a state legislator up in the northern part of the state who got a collection letter from an HOA lawyer. And he said to the lawyer, I never got a warning. And the lawyer said to him correctly at the time, well, you're not obligated to be sent a warning before you get our legal letter, but the association did send you a warning to your email. And he said, well, I never opted in to receive collection notices by email, everything comes by regular mail. So this guy was so frustrated with that circumstance that he campaigned for this new law, which is driving everyone, and I say everyone, I mean the managers and the lawyers crazy because we have to now send this very specific 30 day pre-legal letter. So it's really on people like Raphael's office. They have to send these letters now which means, guess what? Your association is incurring more expenses now because this letter is more cumbersome for your management to prepare. Uh, it's more liability. It has to be done in the statutory form. You know, you can't use your own form. So a lot of these management companies have their own systems and that it's very hard sometimes to adapt them. So, you know, there's been a lot of growing pains. And now, you know, there's all these rules about if you want to send someone a collection notice, you have to send it to them by their regular uh, mail. If you want to switch it to email, they have to affirmatively respond to you that they want to receive it by email. But then more importantly is the 30 day letter. It has to have all the specific language. And again, a lot of associations, when someone owes a debt that's 60 or 90 days old, they used to just say, okay, you know what we sent a courtesy 10 day reminder, send it to the lawyer. Well, now you can't do that. You got to do these 30 day letters. Have you, what's your experience been with them, Raphael? Yeah. So no, it was a, it was a challenge to deal with because we even had to get our software provider because it's not the, the way the, the statute wrote it. We also have to include if it's uh, the assessments that are due, the late fees that are due, the, any interest that's due at that particular moment. 
So we yeah. were fortunate to be able to draft it up. But yes, it be, as you stated, it did become a bit more cumbersome. Um, and there is more liability because now attorneys that are working on the other side are going to want to look, did we miss this particular step in order to say, well, you shouldn't have moved that case to the attorney. So it becomes a little bit more challenging. Ultimately, yeah, definitely. If, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no worries. Ultimately, if you're working with an organized organization, then they're going to be on top of it. But as you stated, it does become a little bit more cumbersome. Um, before it was very simple, just sending a late notice, final notice, and then moving the case to the attorney. Um, now we have these particular uh, ways that we have to follow and make sure that we're giving them the full 30 days and that everything is clearly outlined within the documents. What we've seen I, a I, little bit of a challenge is that management companies really, and our softwares really don't calculate the interest. We move that over uh, to the attorney because you guys handle that because it's, it's calculated normally daily. Um, but we'll see what comes about. You know how it goes. Most of the times when legislation passes, there's always changes the following year. So we'll, we'll see what's going to happen once the, that seat changes uh, next year. Yeah, I mean, we're hopeful. I mean, unfortunately, I think Surfside is going to overshadow this. Yep. Yep. But uh, we were, we're still hopeful that there'll be, and I have a group of colleagues that are willing you know, and ready to try to work on some changes to this because it really is cumbersome and unnecessary. Uh, all the management companies already sent out warning letters anyway. Uh, like you said, having to parse out all the detail systems weren't set up for that calculate interest uh does create added liability and you're right there's definitely going to be defense attorneys that say well you didn't you know dot the i or cross the t in this letter and for that reason your entire foreclosure is invalid or right. even worse they're going to sue the association for fair debt collection practices uh violations so it makes it, it makes it very difficult one thing i will say uh, as a point of action, I would, for Raphael, for your office, I've seen other management companies doing is after the, like, you know, so management companies will sometimes before they send the file to a lawyer, every month they would generate a demand letter. It'd be a 10 or $25 charge. And it'd be give the person five or 10 days or something like that. I've seen that happening still with these 30 day letters. So, you know, we had an association that wanted to send us files and their manager sent the 30 day letters in August. And then a week or so ago, they wanted to send us the files and their management company had again sent the 30 day letter. So now I told them, well, now we can't get it until October. Yeah. And I said, so what I will, what I advise, the 30 day letter should be one and done. One and send done. one. And then if you wanna follow up, if the board wants you to send some follow-ups, go ahead. But as long as they, they're continuing to be delinquent, send that one letter is the first collection letter. If they want to follow up, do a five or 10 day follow up, giving them a little more time. Because otherwise, if you keep sending those 30 day letters, it makes it stuck in that cycle forever. 100%. I mean, and what's even more, if we want to get technical, what's even more confusing with the way it was written was the notice is actually written late notice. So we left it that way because we didn't want to get later be knocked down saying, well, because that was normally our final notice step before we send yeah. it to the attorney, late notice, final notice. So we've had to change everything. Now the first notice is a courtesy so that we don't get beat up on that. And then that last one that we send, it's 30 days. And then once you send that letter, that's it. After 30 days, right. you need to send it to the attorney because that's what you told the resident that you were going to do. And, and, you know, last thing we want is later, we send them later, oh, well, you should have sent us earlier and you right. didn't and have now a different argument for them to make. Right. So look, all this does is make it exact, it makes it easier for people to try to dodge paying. Correct. And it makes it and defend them. And it just, honestly, the other issue is it makes it, it puts an expense on all the people who are paying their dues. Because someone has to get paid, and it's mostly your, you know, management companies. Correct. They they need to get paid for doing this work. Yep. Normally, you know, we charge it all to the owners, or if it goes to the lawyer, the lawyer charges the owner. But now, the neighborhood has to pay for it. So it's kind of a uh, unfair in that way. I think we have a question. Oh, yep. I missed that one. Okay, we have a question from Esperanza. Uh, is it possible to obtain a sample of this uh, warning letter? Uh, is that something you have that you can oh, we provide? can definitely um, if it's who I believe it is hope uh, yes we can definitely provide you that information feel free to email me I'll put my email address here and uh, and we'll can provide you the specific letter that the the legislator provided and just so you're aware uh, that the form of the letter 
the content of it is actually in the statute. The statute yep. has the form. Correct. Uh, but I'm sure, you know, the affinity form takes that and makes it look a lot prettier because the statute is, uh, you know, it, it's kind of got, got blank yes. lines everywhere. Yeah. It's a little <laughs> difficult. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the other item on collections, forever the HOA letters had a 45 day gap. You send the first legal letter, the owner got 45 days to pay. You record a lien, you had to then wait another and send the second collection letter, which is called an intent to foreclose. You had to wait another 45 days before you could file a lawsuit. Well, in the, in the condo statute was always 30 days in between. So again, I think as another consumer protection, instead of it being 30 and 30, now, just like the HOA statute, you have to wait 45 and 45. So they're adding on to your collection process. Like if someone, if you have someone who's just never going to pay, now you're tacking on 30 extra days for the management letter that has to be sent. And between these extended waiting periods, now, in, you know, you're adding 15 days a piece, you're adding another 30 days. So you're basically delaying your recovery by an extra two months because of the legislation that went into effect this summer. So again, hopefully that gets peeled back a little bit because I think it's overreaching and unnecessary. Um, I think, you know, when it was thought up, you know, we were still in the, the midst of uh, COVID mm -hmm. and I just, I just don't think that uh, it makes sense anymore, but we'll see what happens. I think we get another question. Yeah. It's regarding the letter I'm sending on my email. Oh, so I can okay. get that to you. All right, moving on. Uh, the annual budget, uh, this is, you know, and some of these items are more minor. Uh, this just talks about that the budget, uh, you have to adopt the budget at least 14 days prior to the start of the fiscal year. So you don't want to wait till Christmas to uh, adopt your budget. Make sure you get it in before, uh, you know, before the 17th of December. And which, I mean, most people do anyway, because you want to get your coupons printed and mailed out and all that. Um, and if you don't timely adopt the budget for a second time, there is a provision that says that it's a minor violation. You get fined. Uh, you know, the prior year's budget will continue in effect, but they really want you to be timely passing your budgets every year. Keeping in mind with timing again, uh, you know, annual meetings have always required. The second notice always has to be at least 14 days. The statute clarifies now that if your bylaws do not address how many days notice you need for any other unit owner meetings, then it's also 14 days for that, which is good just for consistency. It's, I, I always say the rule of thumb is always 14 day notice for any meeting of your membership. And uh, that's gonna hold true for pretty much every single condominium for your whatever member meeting you're having. Um, moving on to official records. Uh, they have to be, your bids have to be kept for at least one year after receipt. Uh, previously, it had to be seven years. So now it's just one year to keep bids. Uh, and those are records that are accessible to your owners. So if you bid out a project and then your owner wants to see the bids that were not accepted, uh, as long as it's within one year or you otherwise have them at your disposal, they're, they're entitled to see them. Um, there's also a provision under official records uh, regarding renters, they had passed the law. And again, remember earlier, I mentioned that uh, it'd be nice if the legislators asked us our opinion, because a few years ago, the legislature said, well, if a renter wants to look at the bylaws or the articles, uh, I'm sorry, the bylaws and the rules that, that you had to make them available. Well, okay, the rules are good, but the bylaws, most renters don't care about the bylaws. The bylaws are the things that talk about how you hold the election, how many, you know, how, vote, how voting is done by the members, what your requirements are for a board meeting, what they are for a member meeting. They're procedural. And renters don't care about that. What it should have said was that they have access to the declaration, because that's where all the real restrictions are and the rules. So that's been corrected. Uh, you know, they now can inspect the declaration as well as the bylaws and the rules, which is a good thing. You know, if, if a renter wants to know uh, sort of the restrictions on use, uh, they want to know, you know, what they can and can't do. Those, the declaration and the rules are the best sources of that information. Uh, so that was a good change there. And, you know, just adding on to that, um, you know, we're, 
talking about official records. Uh, so we, when we talk about official records, we always talk about inspection of records. And that's something a lot of associations will run into. People want to inspect the records. Uh, well, this was always the law as far as lawyers were concerned because there's cases on it, but now it says in the statute, you cannot ask them to demonstrate a purpose. So if someone says, I wanna see the, all these records, you can't say, well, why do you wanna look at them? They don't have to give any reason whatsoever. It can be because it's a Tuesday. It doesn't matter uh, what their reason is, that's the law, uh, which un I honestly think is unfortunate. I see a lot of abuse with official records requests where angry owners just use them as a way to make the association do busy work uh, and they, they will request an exceeding amount of information. Uh, and I'm sure Raphael, you probably see that too. With yeah, we, we, we do see records. that. What we highly recommend is at the end of the day is making sure that whatever, um, you can upload to either a web portal, if the association's small and they don't have a website, if not putting it up on the association's website to make your management office team, whether you're self-managed or professionally managed, their lives much easier because as Dan stated, uh, we do get that all the time where, you know, someone just wants to be a pest to kill the manager's time to say that they're not doing what they should be doing. Um, but also, again, if you have that situation, make sure that you reach out to your attorney and shout to Daniel. And, and there are certain rules that you can put into place, depending on how your property is structured, where you could set limits. Uh, well, not limits, but necessary time frames of when they can do that records request. So that's the importance of making sure you're consulting with your attorney when you have these challenges. Right. All good points. Uh, and then there's just some other information there about, you know, that they can make, uh, you know, the association now, in addition to making documents available online, they can make them available through an application that can be downloaded on a mobile device. Uh, so, uh, you know, I just have my commentary there and uh, a grandmother discovering a, a cell phone app. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, let's see, next uh, here is natural gas and electric vehicle charging stations installed by unit owners. We'll go to the next step is the ones installed by the association. So a few years ago, the legislature allowed for unit owners to install electric vehicle charging stations in their limited common element uh, parking space. So they've expanded on that. It says now limited common element or exclusively designated parking space, which is a little bit of a change. And I'll explain that. And uh, of course they have to be separately metered. The owner has to pay for all the expenses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this also applies now to natural gas vehicles. Um, you know, so if we go to, in my commentary, the second paragraph, which says the other big change is that they allow for natural gas fuel stations. I don't know about you, Raphael. I don't know anyone that drives a natural gas vehicle that will. Uh, I do all. not. Only in Dominican Republic. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and even then that would be wanting to install a natural gas, uh, you know, pump, so to speak. Uh, I just, it's just not something that I don't, I just, it's not really, those vehicles aren't really a thing here right now. No uh, so I guess that was added. Uh, but my opinion, and going to the, my first commentary paragraph, the bigger change is adding that exclusively designated parking. And here's the reason why. It used to only say you could do this in a limited common element parking space. Most parking spaces are what we call limited common elements. They're owned by the association, but they're limited because only a specific person can use them. So in cases where an owner it wasn't a limited common element, but they actually owned a deed to the parking space. They own the ground of that parking space. And there's, there are some condos where that's the case, where the, the parking space is a deeded parking space. That This law didn't apply to that. So if I owned a deeded parking space, the way this used to be written, my condo could have told me, well, it's not a limited common element, it's your property. Uh, you know, it's not limited common, so you can't put this uh, charging station on it. We're not going to allow it. Well, because of that glitch, uh, they updated it. So now, basically, no matter, doesn't matter how the parking space is characterized uh, legally. If it's someone's, you know, designated parking, they can put in an electric charging station, pay all the costs, uh, and there are rules that you can adopt 
uh, specific to that. And I actually have helped a lot of clients adopt some rules for electric vehicle charging stations regarding installation, removal, insurance, and all that sort of stuff. So have you seen uh, in your properties, have you seen that people are starting to install these things or has it not really happened much yet? So in our properties, I haven't seen it. I've heard, have one association that the owners in um, discovery phase where they're kind of finding out the cost mm -hmm. uh, because obviously they have to uh, uh, do it. I also have one association that's considering adding it as like an amenity. Uh, the only challenge is that they're concerned if they add two spaces with that as an amenity, that then they may have arguments of, you know, who's parked where, at what time, yeah. the length of time and what can come with that. So, you know, they'll just have that's, to put rules together. That's a perfectly good segue into my next slide <laughs> because my next slide has to do with installation of these stations by the association. And nicely, the legislature clarified that if you want to drop one of these stations or multiple in your community as a common expense, uh, you know, just, and I'm talking about just installing the equipment, it's not a material alteration. So uh, you can do it if you, if you make that, uh, if you make that choice. That's fantastic. But what about, like Raphael said, I own a Tesla. If, you know, hey, I'm just going to park it there and I'm going to leave it there overnight and let it charge. Well, what if 15 other people have Teslas and want to, want to charge up? Again, it makes it, you have to now police the parking space. And there's questions about sub metering and you have to make it that, you know, because you don't want it to be a common, the electricity shouldn't be a common expense, right? Correct. So, um, you know, my association doesn't pay for the get my fuel in my, in my car. So why should I pay if some, one of my neighbors has an electric car, I shouldn't be paying for the fuel for their car. So you have to not only install it, but you have to have a pay feature where they, not that they can just hook up and for free charge up, like you could do at a, at a shopping mall that has one of those kiosks, but you need to have them say, hey, you know, you got to put a credit card or something in here if you want to charge up your car. So that's another sort of hoop that we've had to, you know, well, associations have had to think about. Yeah, and we'll start, we'll start seeing more of more of this in the next two to three years. My opinion is that we'll start seeing more of this. There'll probably be companies that are going to come in to solve this problem because eventually, I mean, from where we're going already, you know, GM, Ford, they already have their goals of fully electric. So it's going to be something that uh, it's going to impact our associations, which way we'll see. Um, but it's something that you can't ignore. It, it, it's, it's, it's coming. Yep, absolutely right. It's coming. Uh, and you know what the slowest thing to respond to changes is, is, to technology is the law. So yeah. we'll see how quickly <laughs> we keep up. Uh, some other changes here, alternative dispute resolution, uh, arbitration through the DBPR, which is the De Department of Business and Professional Regulation, Division of Condominiums. For those that don't know, they're an agency up in Tallahassee and they handle some of the more, we'll call them nuisance type of uh, of of disputes between associations and their members. Uh, and for many, many decades, for almost three decades now, there are several causes of action that we had to go through the DBPR. If someone has a barking dog that we wanna get rid of, before we go to court, we have to go through the DBPR. It was, and I will tell you, they were understaffed. The opinions were inconsistent with each other because you have different arbitrators with different outlooks. And for many, many years, you know, we had a case where a guy had a barking dog. He didn't even defend the case. He defaulted. It took us nine months to get the arbitrator to issue us a final ruling about the dogs. Nine months. We called multiple times. Oh, it's on his desk. It's on his desk. So I will tell you, it's thankfully now instead, you can still choose that as an option for these disputes, but Instead, and what we've been doing now across the board for our condo clients, you can use what's called pre-suit mediation. So you can send them a letter that says, hey, instead of going through this DBPR you know, whole process, we can mediate, which means we meet with a third party and see if we can solve our differences. And if that doesn't work or you don't choose to participate in the process, the association can now go right to court and actually get a judge uh, which will moves 
uh, a lot quicker than arbitration does. <clears throat> so this is a very good win. My colleagues and I have been pushing to kind of take away uh, the scope of work from the DBPR for a long time. So, you know, this is, this is a better process. It will be quicker. And when the cases that don't resolve, again, getting a judge and being able to set hearings, like I, in arbitration, I can't set a hearing. I have to wait for the arbitrator to make a decision to set a hearing. Whereas in a court, if I want to be heard on, a, on an issue in a case, I file a motion and we set a hearing on the calendar and that's it. So this is a much better uh, process uh, from my perspective and my colleagues' perspective. Uh, and that's, we're really happy about that. Have you guys had any experience with the DBPR, Rafael? Yeah, we, we've had our challenges and, and things do, you know, do take their time. Um, more so where we get included into things that have nothing to really do with us. And, you know, most of the times, anytime something is filed, we got it dismissed anyway, because mm -hmm. we should have never been involved as a managing company. But, you know, right. I, I was I was meaning, like, have you had experience with, uh, you know, your clients having dealing like with the, oh, yeah, I, yeah. With the frustration of it? It's just it's it's a challenge. As, as you stated, nine months is pretty short. We dealt with something that was about a year, year and a half. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm happy that this change was made. Yep. So that's a good change. Yeah. Uh, other things, again, discriminatory restrictions, the board, if you have illegal discriminatory restrictions in the governing documents, uh, without an owner vote, you can, you know, you can record an amendment that is uh, retracting them. So that's a good thing to, you know, formally get rid of them. Of course, you're not enforcing them anyway. You know, when I was at, uh, I was at a, a firm uh, 12 years ago, and one of our clients had, had, covenants that were from like, they were one of the first condos on Miami beach. It was like from 1960 or something like that. And they actually had provisions in there that were, that talked about the pool bathrooms being separated by race. Uh, and, you know, obviously that was, uh, you know, an archaic discriminatory term that was not being enforced. Uh, but it's nice to be able to formally eradicate those things. So if you ever have anything that is facially discriminatory in your docs, uh, you don't need the members to approve of getting rid of that. You can just record a notice of non-enforcement uh, and get rid of those, and get rid of them. Or you can actually formally amend them out, delete them out right out of your documents. And then finally, fines. Uh, this is just a corrective measure again. Uh, fines, previously they were due five days after the fining committee gave the thumbs up. Now it's five days from the day the note, the notice of the fining committee's decision gets mailed out. So, you know, for Raphael, that's important for your office. Before you guys post a fine to the ledger, you should just make sure that your accounting team is counting five days out from whenever your manager sent the letter to the owner that says, hey, the fine was upheld on, you know, if it was on September 15th, that letter goes out, the ledger, you just don't want that fine to hit the ledger until like September 21st. And that's all for condos. And when we go into HOAs, just for everyone who's going to listen to that as well, and then the COVID stuff is at the end, uh, the HOAs will be much quicker because a couple of the big sections are the same as condo. Uh, so we'll run through that quickly. I don't see any questions from uh, at the moment. So we'll go into the HOAs. Emergency powers. We already went over this, ba basically identical. Uh, so we won't go through all that again. Uh, a new one for HOAs, and this is an important one. If you pass amendments that prohibit or regulate rental agreements after, well, now, after July 1st, uh, they are only effective as to people who vote yes so if people vote no or they don't vote at all, that's that they don't, they aren't affected, or to an owner who takes title after the amendment goes into effect. Those restrictions, again, these are restrictions, amendments that prohibit or regulate rental agreements. If you vote yes in favor of them, or you buy your home after they went into effect, you're subject to them. If you voted against them or didn't vote on them at all, they are not effective as to you. Now, again, commentary you see here, the phrase they use, prohibit or regulate rental agreement, uh, is important because there's several rental provisions 
that have nothing to do with the rental agreement itself. They have nothing to do with how many times you can rent the unit, how long the lease can be. But let's say they are a provision that says if the, if the tenant misbehaves, that the association has the right to evict them. Or there are provisions that say, uh, you know, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna treat a guest that stays there as a resident for more than 30 days, the same as a tenant and they have to be screened. There's all sorts of leasing provisions that I would argue that those don't prohibit or regulate the actual rental agreement. For example, the first one about eviction, that has, has to do with how can we enforce against someone who's a bad resident? You know, Their unit owner might be in New Jersey collecting rent checks every month. If you've got someone who's, who's a nuisance to the community and you wanna have some teeth to get them out, you want to, you know, it's a, it's good to have that eviction right without having to, you know, force the owner to do it. You can just do it directly yourself as an association. I would say that if you passed an amendment like that, that isn't prohibiting rental agreements and it's not regulating them. But someone might argue that the word regulate is open to interpretation. Is evicting a tenant regulating the rental agreement? No, I don't, I don't, again, I don't think so. So again, this is something that's going to need a little work. Just be mindful, though, of these changes. I think we got a question. Yeah, we have a question from Matthew. Matthew asks, is it true that an HOA cannot le levy any types of fines if they don't have a fining committee? Off topic, but yes, correct. <laughs> you must, by statute, you cannot levy a fine in a condo or an HOA without a fining committee. You can threaten to fine someone without a fining committee. Uh, but you can't actually find them unless you have a finding committee. That's by statute. Uh, and again, here, um, talking about this same restriction, there are a couple key exceptions, and I won't read them. You know, you can feel free to read them, but there are some restrictions that you can still pass that can be effective as to everyone, uh, you know, regarding the length of a lease or the number of times a unit can be rented. For example, one of the exceptions is uh, you know you can still regulate it to be for a term that they can't lease for less than six months. So like let's say you know you want you wanted to get rid of Airbnb type use, you can still do that, um, and that's a good thing uh, that there's there's those exceptions there. Uh, there was also uh, with regard to amendments. There's also for the past few years been a requirement that. Uh, the amendment, an adopted amendment being recorded had to be mailed to the owner's address in the, as listed on the property appraiser's website. That is chaotic for your management company because every time they would have to mail that, if you have 500 homes in your HOA, they would have to check the property appraiser website for all of them to make sure that they're, they're mailing it to the, the owner's registered mailing address with that third party property appraiser. Well, now, just like it's always been, it's reverted back that these mailings go to the last known address that's registered with the association. So, you know, your management company is a good for you, Raphael. You guys don't have to uh, feel like you have to constantly be checking the property appraiser for updates. You can rely on the documents that you have. No, that's definitely helped because uh, most of the times we would do that because of the, make sure that we have the proper information. I think, mm -hmm. I, I think the regionals are still kind of still doing it anyway, just to make sure we want to cross our, all our I's and dot our T's, but right. this definitely does help, you know? Yep. I think we have another question. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we have a question from Sharon. Does an HOA have to have a finding committee or can we just go directly to our attorney for rules and regulations that need to be enforced? I mean, unless your documents mandate it, which I've never seen one, you don't have to have a finding committee. Finding is a is one enforcement method, but finding's not always gonna get the job done. We had a guy in one community in Boynton Beach that every month on a Saturday night, he'd have a, he'd have a huge party till three in the morning. And, it, and then on Monday, he'd walk in and say, I know you're gonna find me, here's the hundred dollars. So what does finding do there? Nothing. Uh, so yeah, the answer is you do not have to have a finding committee. You do not have to issue fines. You can just go right to the lawyer and say, hey, we want you to compel their compliance. And I'll tell you, every day, my office, we probably send out two or three letters 
every single day uh, for our clients with various violation type issues where people are doing things they're not supposed to be doing. And we just had one in, in Aventura uh, where there's unfortunately a, a teacher or a coach or something was charged with, with raping a minor and he lives in that community. Uh, it didn't happen in the community, but he lives there. So we, we had to, you know, sending a fine, and he was an unauthorized resident. We didn't even know he lived there. So of course we sent the owner a letter immediately. There's no requirement to go to a fine. Uh, we just said, hey, you got to get this guy out of here now. Um, so look, and that's an extreme example, but your more normal examples, yeah, you can go right to uh, your attorney and say, hey, we want you to get this, you know, do what you got to do. Now you're going to have to pay your attorney uh, to do it. You know, that's part of the cost of doing business. Uh, but, but that's the most effective way if you really want the behavior to be corrected. All right, moving on. Uh, board adopted rules. So again, this is another sort of corrective issue. For the last few years, because of a glitch, again, the legislators did not consult the lawyers. Uh, for the last several years, rules and regulation amendments and HOAs had to be amend had to be recorded, just like a declaration amendment to be effective. Uh, well, that's been corrected, and you know you can read the details of it there. But the bottom line is you no longer have to record amendments to your rules and regulations in an HOA, and you've never had to do that in a condo. You can just pass them as a board, uh, and once you pass them and you put, it, put the language into the document, they're effective. Board meeting notice. Uh, I'm gonna skip over that one because it's not really all that important. Uh, you can just read through that at your, at your leisure. Uh, election and recall disputes. This is similar to what we discussed for condos. Uh, again, uh, you know, before the HOA was not subject to DBPR, that arbitration I was telling you about earlier, except for elections and recalls. Well, now, just like we covered in condominiums, you can still go through the division of condominiums at the DBPR, or you can file it directly with court. And in, interestingly, for this one, Pre-suit mediation for these disputes is not required. You can go right to court if you have an election dispute or a recall dispute. So uh, again, that's another uh, good thing. We're divesting the DBPR of, of their role, which I, again, I, I feel bad for the people who work there, but I felt worse for my clients because it was just a very uh, impractical and, and slow process. Uh, now we're talking about official records, uh, ballots and signing sheets, proxies, and other papers related to the voting. They have to be kept for one year. So that's a distinction now similar to condo. So all the election related materials, got to keep them for one year. So that's an important one for your guys, Raphael, your people. Mm -hmm. And importantly, they provide that in a gated community, the guests, the list of guests visiting a resident are protected and they cannot be inspected. So, you know, if you want to know, hey, I want to see all the people going to my neighbor's house, that is not an that is not one that you can be seen and can be seen. And the reason, again, I think there was an HOA where there was some either it was like a divorced husband and wife, or there was there was some some cheating or something. And there was someone, one spouse was asking for a guest list of all the people who were coming to and from the home. And uh, the law now says, well, that's, you know, that's private enough information that we're not going to let that list of, of people. Because, you know, at a gated community, you got to pull up, you get, they always ask, can we have your ID or you have to stick it in a machine? And they know who's, they have your car, a picture of your car a lot of the times, uh, or your license plate. So they know who's coming and going. And if people want to be vindictive, again, especially with, you know, an ex-spouse or ex-boyfriend or whatever, uh, you know, pulling up that information uh, really is private. And I, I agree with that, James. I think that information should be private. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Rafa. You have no, yeah, that I would say I would agree. That. I mean. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then we have reserves. Again, this is a technical item. Reserves used to be in, established in an HOA in three different ways. 
And basically the law is just taken away one of those. Again, that has to do really with communities that are very early on uh, at turnover. Because if your community's an HOA that's been standing for a long time, this is not gonna be too relevant to you, uh, this change. But if you're turning over, it's, you know, it's important to understand that they took out one of these ways. And condos always have to have reserves. Mm -hmm. People can vote to waive them, but there's, you know, it, there's no such thing as a condo choosing, well, do we want to have reserves or not? You have reserves. It's just how much money you're going to pay into them. HOAs, there is no statutory requirement to have reserves. There, there are these ways to opt into it, though. So that information's there. Uh, and again, this is just some case law information for purpose of our discussion. It is probably really boring, so we're going to move on from that. Uh, collection letters, we already went over this in the condo, exact same provision, exact same issues uh, that we had earlier, whether it's a condo or HOA, your management company now, or you as an association, if you're not a managed association, uh, you have to do this letter before you send the file to the lawyer for collections. Uh, again, similar to condo, the board can remove discriminatory restrictions. So that's very similar. Also similar to condo, again, the fine, uh, the same change. The fine is due five days after the uh, notice of the approved fine is sent, not five days after the meeting was held. And now we get into probably the two most important uh, or, I'll, or I should say, you know, I don't want to call them popular, but, uh, you know, issues that we have with COVID-19 legislation. The first one is vaccine proof documentation. I've had many boards say, Dan, can we tell people they can't come in our clubhouse without their proof of vaccination? My answer is that you can do whatever you want, but the law that the governor initially passed and that the legislature ratified, it says that, you know, that a business entity is not allowed to disallow access or services based on COVID-19 vaccination. Um, so when you see my commentary, there's some debate as to whether is an association a business entity uh, and are owners considered patrons or customers? I can tell you the overarching sentiment is yes, this law applies to associations. So if you are having association events, you could run afoul of this law if you are requiring vaccination. I have had some clients say, we don't care. Let someone sue us because we feel like we want to make sure that people are vaccinated to come in our clubhouse if we're having events or social or just regular just usage. And if they want to sue us, go ahead. And if, if the state, you know, if we are deemed a business entity, so be it. Uh, I haven't had anyone get sued yet, but I will tell you most associations are not requiring the proof of vaccination. We all know that's kind of a hot button issue, uh, vaccinating. And, and so that's, uh, that's where that stands. Have you run into any issues with this in your, in your communities? So fortunately enough for us, most of our boards, there's one particular board that was looking to go that way. And, and, you know, we had to explain to them multiple things because it needs to be a balanced approach. Number one, if you're going to do that for the residents, is that going to need to be required of the employees as well? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's so many challenges that come with it and, and it really depends on your community as well. I can understand with the older communities, you're 55 and older where, you know, you have your vulnerable um, individuals. But ultimately, it's challenging enough just to get someone to listen to the basic rules and regulations of an association and now having to have either a front desk concierge or someone at a clubhouse to start managing this. It's, it, it's almost impossible and it'll be very challenging. Further, yep. when you add on top of that, the job market that we have today, um, you know, it, 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 there's so many factors that while it's a great idea or a good idea for your residents to protect which is what a board is supposed to do. There's so many outside factors that you have to take into consideration that quickly shoot this down in, in a second, yep. that it doesn't make sense to, to, uh, to put these kinds of uh, rules and regulations or policies in your association. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, besides the legal consideration, are we allowed to do this or not? Logistically, like you said, we, I said to some of my clients, I said, okay, you're not gonna allow any, any of the residents to come into the clubhouse 
Are you allowing the staff to come into the clubhouse? Are they all vaccinated? Are you requiring right. them? What about event? What if you have to repair the AC in the clubhouse? Are you checking the repair men, their crew for their vaccination? So again, like you said, it becomes uh, a monitoring nightmare. Uh, and especially in buildings or, or communities that are large and have a lot of people coming and going, are you going to have someone stand at the door of the clubhouse and constantly be checking people's vaccination card? And again, it's it's a hot button political issue. Yeah. You're going to get confrontations from people that say, it, you know, it's my right to be unvaccinated and I'm an owner and, you know, the governing documents don't say that that my use of the common areas is conditioned on on a medical, uh, you know, vaccination. So, you know, look, it's I, for all those reasons, yeah. uh, we've advised our clients not to do it. And it, you know, it sounds right. like you're doing I the mean, same. I mean, it could even go as far as, okay, well, the board members, are they vaccinated? It, it can get yep. so complicated really quick. Yep. Yep. So there's the, there's the X. <laughs> uh, the other one is liability protection. Another big question was, you know, if we, you know, don't clean the pool sufficiently and someone gets COVID, can we get sued? If we don't, you know, have these pro, you know, the bathroom isn't sanitized enough. You know, if we only have it done cleaned once a day or twice a day, is that enough? Can we get sued if someone gets COVID? <clears throat> and basically the, the governor, and again, ratified by the legislature, came out with a COVID liability shield law, which basically says that uh, as long as you made a good faith effort, to comply with any requirements uh, or standards that you know that you're going to be shielded from liability. Now, look, if your association says, "Yeah, let's pack the the auditorium with 500 people and have have our annual New Year's Eve party," is that a good idea? And people all get COVID, and is this going to shield you? Probably not, because uh, you know because it's you're not making a good faith effort to to protect against the spread of of covid but otherwise if you're just doing your normal business procedures you're cleaning things properly you should be protected and that's good because look they didn't want people to come up with all these covid lawsuits again i mean and i told some of the clients are worried about it i said look i said how is someone going to prove they got covid right. from your swimming pool i mean unless yeah. unless they can prove that for all the months of covid they never stepped foot out of their condo or home until they went to your swimming pool. And then they went directly home and nowhere else and, and they contracted COVID. Otherwise, how are they going to prove it? If they stepped foot, if they went into a Publix or a bank or, or anywhere else where there's other people, I don't know how they could possibly say, well, I got it here and not there. So I think, honestly, the people were worried at first about COVID contraction and you know, wrongful death, and you know, my husband died from COVID. He got it in the community gym, you know, and oh my, you know, and the insurance companies were basically kind of sending signals like, yeah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna cover this uh, under some exceptions that they have for what they call disease, but this falls under it. Um, so anyway, it's good that this is out there. It'll, it just prevents, uh, you know, these lawsuits from really even getting started at all. Is as what I would call like a nuisance lawsuit. Um, and again, I think if they, as long as you complied uh, with all the, any government directives, you know, for a while, you know, the counties had various uh, curfews and they had cleaning requirements and all that. Uh, as long as you, you did the right thing, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna be pretty well shielded from this liability. So uh, with that, I think uh, that's, that's it. So. Uh, Raphael, do you, I don't see any other questions. Nope. Uh, nope. If you had, do you have any uh, parting advice or qu comments for the group? Sure. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, I wanted to thank you for, for a great uh, webinar, for great information that you provided to both the managers and board members that are here. Um, as we stated earlier, we're very much into education and we find it that it's much easier to work with our board members that, that are educated and understand what's going on with the laws, the changes that occur. There's so many changes that occur each year that it's good to be um, updated. So uh, if you've enjoyed the webinar, I know I had the question a couple of times with what's Dan's contact information. You'll find it here. Um, Ashley from our team will be sending an email to all of you within the next 48 hours, letting you know of Dan's contact information as well as Affinity's contact information. We'll also post the webinar 
on our YouTube page. So you can feel free to share it with your fellow managers or with your fellow board members. Um, and again, I, I wanted to thank you, Dan. I don't know if you have any closing remarks for our managers and, and board members that are attendants. Sure. Well, I see there's one last question about someone having an event with 200 residents dancing and sitting at tables of 12. Is that not advisable? Uh, probably <laughs> not. I mean, look, the way things were going uh, a few months ago before the D variant, if we were at this point in time now and didn't have the D variant, I'd say, eh, OK, we're probably enough removed from it. But I would I would say, look, I wouldn't be having these big sanctioned uh, you know, these events that are run by the association, unless maybe like, I think outdoor events would be okay. Um, but, but not indoor events. I mean, it depends how close the quarters are. I mean, 200 people sounds like a lot, but it could be in a giant auditorium. Correct. Um, so again, it, it's somewhat situational and look, this is unprecedented. I don't know. Is that going to be, you know, if someone got COVID and again, could prove they got COVID at this party, which good luck, uh, you know, I, I still think you might be shielded by the law potentially, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, so good last question, Raphael, again, thanks for the opportunity to be in front of everyone, your managers and your board members, uh, and all the board members who are on for all of you managers, board members who are out there. Uh, again, my information is here. Uh, you know, I, I work my butt off to be, uh, really available, accessible. I think that that I find, you know, you can be the best lawyer in the world. And I know some lawyers that are great lawyers, but some of the clients I have say, yeah, you know what? He's a great lawyer, this other guy, but I could never get a hold of him. He was the best lawyer I'd ever seen in my whole life. But you know what? The fact, you know, they, they say in sports, your best ability is availability. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, so you could be the best basketball player in the world, but if you're never, if you're always injured, you're not very worth, you know, worthy for your team. So, Again, if you want someone who's going to always be there for you uh, and who's, you know, this is all he does and very well versed, I'd be happy to hear from any of you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dan. We appreciate your time. Um, for all those board members and managers, we'll see you at our next webinar. Um, you'll probably receive an email within about a week or two. But again, Dan, thank you so much for, for the opportunity today and for all the information that you provided. We'll sure. see you all at our next webinar. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.